morning. So we have two great speakers here today. Uh, this is Professor Sue Carter from the uh, University of California at Santa Cruz. So he will give us uh, two talks. The first talk is Photovoltaics for Sustainable Agriculture. Okay, thank you very much. So I guess I gotta turn this on, right? Is this on? Push and hold. I should be able to follow that instructions. How about that? Can you hear me? Hello, 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 hello. The green lights on. Okay. 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 So I'm going to talk about uh, a topic that I've been spending a, a good deal of my time over the last uh, year working on, which is what it will take for sustainable agriculture. This is a, a very different um, field that probably you've been hearing a lot about here, and maybe been covered a little bit. Uh, and the fact that everything we're doing, we're basically doing on very, very large scale. So I brought a little teeny demo with me of what we're working on, uh, but uh, most, and most of the stuff I can't actually bring because they're actually on the scale of large scale modules. And so I'll talk about why this field is interesting and try to justify it. So most of you probably know that one of the early applications of photovoltaics, which was actually quite a successful application, was uh, photovoltaics for uh, pumping water both for uh, livestock and also for fields. Um, in California, this is of interest because uh, the electricity cost for pumping water for agriculture is about $2 billion a year, of which about 70% of that is spent in California. And uh, those numbers are actually anticipated to grow substantially, particularly with things like droughts occurring um, throughout the grid. So this is an interesting application of PV for ag. However, it's, it's not something I'm going to talk about at all today because it's not something that's going to get you to terawatt numbers. So the question is, um, what, what, what can we do that's a little bit more penetration than what you can do with just water? So uh, the, the biggest answer to uh, trying to get solar to extend it uh, to these terawatt volumes needed to, um, needed to meet the world's energy needs is uh, solar farms in the desert. So you hear a lot of the, about those, particularly if you're in California. And I think uh, 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 Peter Lewis mentioned uh, the desert tech concept, which is this idea that we're going to actually provide all of Europe's power from uh, building PV panels pretty much in uh, the northern part of Africa, the deserts there. And suppose we're going to basically replace the entire uh, voltage system or our high voltage transmission lines to basically get the loss down to about 3% per 600 uh, miles, and that's going to solve uh, the load there. Some of you believe that, or some of you thought this was a fantasy. There's two projects I want to bring up in California that are going up right now. Uh, one is the Ivanpah project, which is going on in the Mojave Desert. It's done by Bright Source. It's a concentrating solar power technology. You can't really see, but it's already it's already being constructed. I want you to keep these numbers in mind. It's 2.2 billion dollars, which involves it includes a 1.6 billion dollar loan from the DOE. If you do the math, you figure that out to about five dollars and sixty cents a watt. Okay, this is not a cheap, necessarily cheap PV system. And it's on 1,400 acres. The other one's a Calico project that's been bought and sold by several people. It's now by K Road Power. It's a 618 megawatt facility. If it goes up, I'd say if, that's 1,800 hectares. And you can do the math very quickly, those numbers I just throw you out and ask what the approximate peak power efficiency of both of those projects are. And you just divide through by the watts they claim they're going to produce by the amount of land they claim that they're taking up in these PV panels, you'll figure out that the concentrated solar power is about 28 watts per meter squared. This is peak, right? This isn't divided through by the number of hours. And 34 watts per meter squared. So if you've actually converted those over to power efficiency, you get a number right around 3%. Okay, so this is what we're producing and putting up in the desert right now. I want to keep these numbers in mind because uh, uh, those, those are the types of uh, installation numbers. Because you always hear about these numbers of 10%, 20%, but that's what's actually getting installed is not. Now there are challenges with desert farms, which if you're in California, you learn very quickly. And a lot of them are environmental. So the environmentalists in California are up in arms against the PV industry, which is um, interesting. We never thought that the solar industry would be, uh, would be against, would, would be at odds with the environmental industry, but that's exactly what's happening. And um, there was a 2009 bill by the Feinstein to block many of the Mojave solar farms. Um, and that was built was fairly successful. It was led by a lot of environmentalists. Uh, that caused Bright Source to, 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 to decrease the size of the system they were going to, and they abandoned the Broadwell site, which is one of the places that they were going to put because Feinstein wanted to build that into a national uh, monument. 
more recently in 2012, the environmental groups have filed suit again over the installation of PV at the Calico site. This is a 618 megawatt facility. And just a few weeks ago, the railroad that drives right past the Calico site just basically filed a formal complaint with the Calvin Energy Commission saying that somehow that PV system is going to interfere with their railroad operations. Okay. Um, there, are, there are lots of endangered species in deserts. One of them is the desert tortoise. This is causing bright source all sorts of pain and agony because they just, they've so far spent $56 million just trying to save that turtle. Okay, in the site that they're going up. Uh, there's been a lot of environmental reports coming out showing that deserts are large CO2 sinks. So people are so concerned about what's going to happen um, uh, when we start destroying these uh, desert ecosystems in terms of the CO2. It actually might be some people think that the CO deserts are actually the missing link uh, to the CO2 uh, sink. There's obviously water consumption issues, but that's only for concentrator systems. And then another interesting one is there's huge amounts of um, uh, bacteria and uh, algae and stuff growing on the crust of these deserts. Um, by you basically completely destroy, they're only on the first few millimeters of the surface, you completely destroy them when you put up any pea farm. Um, and that's predicted to lead to massive dust storms, which is not particularly what you want when you're in the when you're running a pea pad. So this, these have all been potential issues with desert soil farms, which delayed development in California. You also have the infrastructure issue because people just don't live near deserts. So you have to run a lot of power lines out to get the power from the deserts. So I'm going to ask, um, and, and these are a couple of quotes I just pulled out because I think they're interesting quotes. One is from uh, Larry Haig of the Desert Protection Council. He says, we don't see forests being clear cut to make way for solar mirrors because that would clearly be absurd. Yet thousands, even millions of acres of desert are currently proposed to be scrapped to make way for solar power plants and their company transmission lines. His point is the desert is just as valuable to people's citizens as a forest. And you know why we why we feel like we can sacrifice the deserts, and then from um, then go at that point, California Governor Schwarzenegger said, "If we cannot put solar plants in the Mojave Desert, I don't know where the uh, we can put it." Uh, uh, and then um, the one I want to focus on last last uh, quote is, "We don't have to choose between having renewable energy development or complying with the Endangered Species Act, which is what our current choice is right now. We can have them both, and certainly the California experience is that we have resources." So I want to focus, so ready to talk, I'm going to focus on what the alternative is for solar farms. And to start this debate, the reason why uh, people have been talking about deserts for so long is because there's a lot of solar insulation. There's a lot of solar radiation there, so you can, you, that's, that's good for solar. So I just want you to think about um, what city you think has the most solar radiation. And this depends on the time. And I've got a couple of op op options, for you, uh, options for you, too, which are in deserts, uh, Cairo, Egypt, and Las Vegas. America's Spain, which will become very important for reasons that will come up in just a second. Honolulu, Hawaii, and Fresno, California. I would have done this as a clicker question, but we don't have clickers. So. so think about it, come up with your best choice, and I'll tell you what the answer is here. Honolulu, Hawaii. Okay. Um, but the point is they're all very similar. They're not all that different. Uh, and I, just to put up there, I put up uh, the Netherlands, the brightest city in the Netherlands, just to give you an idea, it's about 2.83 uh, is the average uh, solar insulation. These are, of course, hours per day, average hours per day of sunlight, and also Cal uh, Catania, Italy, which will come up later. But as you'll see, there's two areas, Almeria, Spain, and Fresno, California. They're going to keep on coming up a little bit later at the top. Uh, those numbers are actually pretty big. And these are, Fresno is the top... Uh, County in the United States for agriculture, and Almeria, Spain, is the top producer of greenhouse-grown vegetables in the world, uh, and provides most a lot of the food for Europe. So let's look again at this world map. This is what everybody looks like when they're going to try to figure out about solar farms. The top is the world's deserts, and if you the bottom below that is the solar radiation. If you look at those and compare them, you can see well, yeah, in the world's deserts, there's lots of sun. Um, but if you also look at the population map over here, you'll see that where there's deserts, there's no people. Okay, that's, you know, that's, that's probably not surprising. But I want to focus right now is this, is this uh, agricultural map. That's the one on the top here. And the yellow is in cropland. And what you'll see, of course, which probably isn't shocking, is that where there's a lot of cropland, there's a lot of people. Okay, so these agricultural areas are, are people where 
where uh, people live. And um, furthermore, there's a lot of these agricultural areas are also places, if you look down here, where there's a lot of solar radiation. You have to because you need sun to, to grow crops, right? So the ag areas um, are areas where not only you have lots of people, but you also have a lot of sun. And this has not gone unnoticed by uh, people in the PB community. Um, Fresno now is ground zero. Now with all the problems with the deserts, Fresno is ground zero for PV installation in California. Um, it's the largest, like I said, it's the largest inland city in California. It's Six billion in agricultural sales in that county alone. It's the number one agricultural county in the United States. And this is now they've got hundreds of PV installations proposed for this area. Okay. And there's a report uh, in. January 2012 from the California report that says making hay while the sun shines and flap over solar panels in farm country. They're putting up PV panels so fast in this area, they're kicking out the farmland, just, just eliminating the prime farmland. Um, and so much so, the California Farm Bureau is in an interesting position of suing Fresno County uh, due to its decision to allow PV farms, particularly on prime agricultural lands. That's the, that's the lands right next to all the base stations, right? The, the PG&E uh, and Southern Edison base stations. Uh, and these are all protected by the Williamson Act, which basically doesn't allow you to take agricultural land out of production. Uh, you get a tax break if you don't take agricultural land out of production. So the point is, you just don't want to put PV panels in and take the, ag take the agricultural land out of production. This is, this is, a, this is a not a solution to our solar farm problem. And then I also want to point out uh, Andalusia, Spain. A, there, a city in Andalusia, Spain, which is called Iberia. It has a hundred thousand hectares of uh, greenhouses. It's the biggest greenhouse facility in the world. It's so big that you can see it from space. And it's one of the few areas in the country that in the world that's actually going global cooling right now because of um, some all the light reflected off the greenhouse roof. So this area is, this area has lots of sun and it also has to be ground zero for uh, for Spain's so PV that same uh, county or same area of countries is where Spain has installed all their PV systems. Uh, in, in 2008, in fact, most of the, the majority of the solar PV plants actually went up in Spain and Europe. Um, and these are just some of them. So solar Car, by the way, is my Amigo Solar. They're actually located in, in um, Lakewood, and they're the company that we work with quite extensively on this, uh, on this project. OK, so the point here is to say that, that, that solar and ag are starting to come together. Right? We're starting to see more and more PV systems going up and solar farms being proposed in areas which are high agricultural. And you can do the math. These are the, uh, so the agricultural solar farms, the potential cropland is about 8.5 billion acres. That's about 34 trillion meters squared. You can do the math and multiply by 10 watts per meter squared, which is a pretty um, you know, reasonable number for what you'd expect uh, for PV panel once you divide through by the um, hours that it runs, so only five hours per day it runs. And you end up getting 340 terawatts of potential PV power from your ag lands. So that basically means you cover a little over 4% and get the 15 terawatts, which is pretty much as close to the current uh, world demand. So, um, and if you just look at the PV greenhouses, the greenhouse is going to come, come up quite a bit. That actually can get you um, uh, 100 gigawatts, not enough to do a depth of terawatt number, but still an impressive number. Um, and now Mary alone could generate 10 gigawatts, but certainly by enough power for Spain. Because these are, so these are not small numbers. Uh, the nice other thing I see about agricultural land is there's very little you know, environmental impact you've got to deal with. I mean, the lands have already been developed, right? So, I mean, yeah, there are probably some insects and bugs and stuff, but you're, you're, it's, not a, it's not a big deal. And the infrastructure requirements aren't, aren't much of an issue because most of these ag lands are near where people live and uh, already have fairly good infrastructure. Okay, so this is what people are looking at. Ag. But the question is, we can't afford, the world population is, is growing, we can't afford to lose 4% of our ag lands to PV. Just like we can't afford to lose 50% of our corn land to ethanol, right? So um, the question is, can we make PV into agricultural covers without negatively impacting plants? And that's the goal of what we're trying to do. So um, Italy's, uh, Italy, uh, of course, has a big greenhouse industry. Uh, and they uh, really came on strong with the PV integrated greenhouses. Uh, they have um, a billion of rated PV incentives, which makes a whole bunch of people salivate, especially here in the U.S. And uh, they did a study which basically showed that they just covered 20% of their greenhouses. They can generate 5.8 gigawatt peak. 
Um, and Sardinia actually set a three-year, 500 megawatt uh, uh, goal on PV installed greenhouses. Um, now, this is a couple of designs that they came up with. You can't see them very well here. But what you'll see is the PV covers, in one case, all the roof, and in the other case, half the roof. What does that do to the plants? Shades. It kills them. Yes, it shades them. It kills them, right? So you basically wiped off um, your plants. You know, the people that installed this didn't care. So they're making more money off these huge incentives off the PV. They didn't care if they took out their crops. But the point is, this is not a solution, okay? You cannot, you know, and, and it's because of that, the sardines at the 75% luminosity, but, you know, you can't, you don't want to do this if you're going to kill the plants in this backwards. Um, here's a technology out of, um, out of Spain. It's a low concentration system, but if you look at the design, it's got, you can see it's got PV panels with uh, uh, little uh, lenses there, which looks like it focuses down on the PV. Um, but this is, the PV's covering, again, 30% of the roof. This is not going to be good. This is likely, this is likely to reduce crop yield. So um, I would argue that this potentially is probably not necessarily the solution either. The Dutch have been uh, very smart about this. They're also, the, they're also the leaders in greenhouse building. Um, and even though they don't have much sun, they're determined to take advantage of whatever sun they've got. And uh, I can't pronounce it, but I think it's Wagon Engine. Wagon. What? Wagon Engine. OK, thank you. Wagon Engine has uh, two designs. I'm going to show you one here. This one's actually very clever. It's a Fresnel design. They just replaced the glass panels in the roof with Fresnel lenses. And, um, and then they basically take a PV cell and they position it in the focal plane of the Fresno lens and convert power, and then they want all the light to fall on the plants, they pull the Fresno lens out of the way. This looks very clever, uh, but you, the problem here is the Fresno lens are going to distort the light behind the plants, which basically means you've got a real hard uh, problem in terms of exactly how you're going to, where you're going to plant in the greenhouse, and it's potentially costly because of the components. And, you know, also they're, they keep on working on this, and this is another design they have. This is, um, this is an IR reflector design where they basically have modified the roof line of the uh, greenhouse roof to put in uh, uh, curved panels that, can, that have an IR reflector in there that, that reflect the light back into a PV panel where they have a motor, a PV panel on the motor. Um, and this is also an interesting design, but if you actually go through the numbers and you get out from the IR light, the numbers aren't particularly high. Um, you don't have a lot of light in the lens to start out with. Um, and also, um, a lot of the, the biggest market for uh, greenhouses, at least, is current greenhouses that already exist. You want to be able to retrofit the roof. This is not a retrofit design, right? This will only work on new greenhouses. Um, so it's inherently limiting because you need this, you need this curvature. But they're, they're certainly interesting um, solutions. Uh, Slindra, right before they did their last gasp, was, uh, was in Italy, spending a lot of time in Italy. Uh, and they were proposing that I don't, I, the Slindra thing is. This video is actually an Italian video. Slender was basically claiming that their, uh, their six modules were perfect for, for, for crop covers. Um, you can see like, they, they have their tubes in the center because the tube, the way it works, some of the, right, some of the light can go through. Um, they, they shade about 30%, and they actually had a lot of research going out at UC Davis and other places showing that this actually, in some cases, improves crops. In many cases, it, it doesn't. Um, and that was one of their big, uh, and then I'm going to show you one more. I'm going to show you a movie here after this one. Um, and this is a, 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 a technology out of England. It's amorphous silicon based. Um, and it's by a company called Polysolar. And they're, uh, let me show you this right now. Uh, let's see if I. This is the world's first domestic, uh, they claim the world's first domestic greenhouse. Our solar panels are quite a common sight on our roofs now. But a Cambridge company claims to have gone one better. Polysolar's latest product means your greenhouse makes your house green. You just can't stop looking at it. Better than a sports car, says Jim. Well, that's a special one. Stronger than standard greenhouses and better at growing things. The solar panels on this shiny example provide a third of this house's electricity requirements. It's innovative. Which is absolutely right. That's the red color. That's going to be come back. And there's no doubt about it. I really love it to present. It's going to keep me busy. It's going to save me money, too. These photovoltaic glass panels are actually part of the greenhouse itself, not an add on. 
They scoop up the sun, then feed into the veins. Not only is it performing the function of the greenhouse, and in fact it's actually a more effective greenhouse than a conventional greenhouse, but it's also generating power to power your home and therefore you're getting free electricity. If you're one of these people who doesn't want ugly panels tacked on your roof or can't put them on your roof because of shading and angles, a greenhouse in the garden is the solution. It's electricity coming in, not going out. Now, why don't you pay attention to these numbers? <laughs> A greenhouse like this will cost you around £7,000. In 18 years, it will have paid for itself. Polysolar is going to sell around 100 in the first year. A budding okay. business in the making. Joseph Paul, have you seen the East Cambridge? So, 18 year payback time is what they're claiming. Is anybody going to pay for 18 year payback time? Oops, why is this not okay? No. In the US, it's five years. Okay? So, this is a nice technology. Um, but uh, uh, it, it, it's not gonna, it's not gonna make it for for widescreen applications. So, um, so I think you probably know the answer to this. You saw the color of that greenhouse. But I'll ask you this: uh, Of course, the solar spectrum is most utilized by plants. Blue, green, red, or infrared? How many people think blue? How many people think green? You guys have no idea, do you? How many people think red? Okay, you do have an idea. And of course, infrared. So red is the magic ingredient. Plants are green, obviously, because they don't absorb green, they reflect green, right? And that means that they absorb blue and red. Okay, so you need blue and red. And that's because that's where chlorophyll absorbs. It's, uh, it uh, has an absorption peak right around, uh, depending on the chlorophyll, right between 450 and 480. Another absorption peak right around 620 to 680. Okay, and when I first worked on organic PV cells, I'm like, oh, MHPV was the material I was working on way back then. Like, MHPV greenhouses, that's the solution. Uh, um, and uh, I ended up, I abandoned that for various reasons. Oh, this doesn't show up. Um, the red light, for some reason it's not showing up on the screen. The red light is actually used for flour and sugar production. The blue is used mostly for biomass, but the red light's the key. If you enhance the red light, you enhance the plants. And the LED communities realize that if you go buy a grow lamp, right now you'll get something that's very reddish. It has some blue in it, but it's mostly red because that's the colors that the plants need to thrive. Um, and uh, this, the, the, the ability of plants to grow better under red light was realized for, for some time, and there's an early paper in 1990 where someone just took a luminescent material uh, uh, over the roof, uh, this is the ground up here, and basically what they did is they took out the green part of the spectrum, enhanced the red part of the spectrum, that's why that black line is going above the baseline, and showed that they grew tomatoes under this, this, this fluorescent material, they got on average a 20% improvement in their crop yield uh, by putting the material under the fluorescent light. SEBA then actually, now, which is known by BASF, went out and commercialized this technology as just a greenhouse cover just to put over uh, 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 greenhouses and crop covers to basically enhance rose growth and plant growth. And they sold it for quite a while. Um, and this product only lasted for two years. Okay, they still sold it. So it's an interesting, interesting issue. So what does this have to do with PV? Well, um, there's a technology called luminescent solar concentrators that came out quite a while ago and got abandoned for some, some, some good reasons. It's been re-emergent now. Um, it's an area that we've been working on, but we've modified our design quite a bit from what a standard luminescent solar collector would be. And that is, um, we use a case where the PV cell, um, I'll show you this later, uh, the PV cell is uh, front mounted instead of, um, instead of edge mounted. That makes it a lot cheaper and allows us to get direct power output from the PV cell itself. So what this luminescent material does is it absorbs, uh, it absorbs the, the sun spectrum. It re-emits the light. In this case, it does it with about 85% efficiency. And then that light waveguides down your, your sheet, and it will be converted to power by the PV cell. Okay. The material we're particularly using is an LR305 material. It has an emission spectrum right where plants are very happy, right about 600 nanometers. So any light that isn't waveguided is OK. It falls on the plants and helps the plants grow. So it will be fine. Uh, and then, of course, we absorb all the green. That's okay. The plants don't like that. We absorb a little bit of the blue, but actually not enough for the blue to really hurt the plants, which I'm going to demonstrate in a second. So, um, this is nice technology in greenhouses or in crop covers, and also the fact that you can take, even though this isn't a bifacial cell, 
light that gets reflected out is going to be absorbed by this luminescent material and be emitted. So you basically have, uh, it works very well under diffuse direct or direct light. So um, that's what we're working on. Uh, this is a prototype greenhouse we have built uh, at UCSC Arboretum. We have two of them, one that's a clear and one that's a control. This is the uh, one that's a clear greenhouse as a control and one that has our technology in the roof. That's our panel. Here's a more recent design, which is a little bit more efficient. Um, and you can calculate out what the power efficiency is of these, what we call now wavelength sector, solar collectors, to distinguish from luminescent solar collectors, because we're actually trying to pick out only certain wavelengths of the solar spectrum. Um, and there's uh, the power efficiency is just equal to the, uh, the amount that you get directly from direct illumination on the PV cell. That has to do with, just do with the area of that PV cell over the entire area of the entire module. And then there's a component due to the uh, luminescent solar concentrator portion or the uh, luminescent material portion, which has to do with the area of that luminescent material over the area of the entire module. Times parameters like the photoluminescence efficiency, the amount of solar, solar spectrum you're absorbing, the wave guide efficiency, the down conversion losses and energy, um, and of course the power efficiency of that solar cell at the wavelength of light you're emitting, which is kind of some sort of a quasi monochromatic power efficiency. So if you plug those numbers in with, with these numbers here, which are things I think we can reasonably get to, what you'll find out is you'll find out you drop this cell that's normally 20% power efficiency down to about 10%. When you use this technology, you say, Sue, you're going the wrong direction. You've just taken a 20% solar cell and now we have a 10% solar cell. And sometimes you're right, but we've done it with only 15% of the PV cell we needed before. Right? So we're only taking our entire module that takes up 15% of the PV. So we've reduced the power by 2x, but so we've reduced the amount of PV by 6x. I've replaced a material that's $200 per meter squared with a material that's $10 per meter squared. Okay. So um, it ends up that this gives you an inherent cost savings, and the, the real benefit for us is it allows us to grow plants underneath our PV panels. Um, so that's, uh, I, I want to be for truth of advertising, RL or 305 is not optimized. It only absorbs a small portion of spectrum, about 22%, not 15%. So right now we're getting about 4% in our one meter squared modules, okay? Um, but we're working on, uh, actually that's probably, we get up to five to six, we're probably good enough for uh, installing some units. So the question is, what does it do to the plants? And we started out just by looking at what the luminescent material did to the plants. We did tomatoes and strawberries. So we just built these little boxes. As you can see, we have a clear box and then different, different intensities of luminescent material. To point out different parts, of the, different percentage of the solar spectrum, and 60% is just our kind of quasi measurement of how concentrated it is. 90% means it's very concentrated dye, and 30% is kind of low. And what you can see if we look at tomatoes, uh, the total number of, uh, of fruits, what happens is you get an increase. That's because you're stimulating more flower production. You get a lot more flowers coming out of the tomatoes when you stimulate the red light. Strawberries, the numbers are a little bit less conclusive, but for certain concentrations, we also see. Um, enhanced strawberry production over what you would do with just a clear greenhouse. Now right now, we don't even care if we get enhanced production. We just care that we're not killing the plants, right? But right now, the numbers are coming up positive. But this is also kind of a cheap, because I don't have the PV panels in there, right, which also are shading the ground. Uh, so we actually did studies uh, inside our two, these are our two greenhouses at the UCSC Arboretum, so we can do controls between those two. These are just different cucumbers we grew. Um, we started with cucumbers and tomatoes, those are really hard plants because those are high light density plants, right? You could, you could probably pick a low light density plant and have no positive results, but these are the ones we started with. And you can see again the total number of flowers, this isn't fruit, but we now have fruit numbers. Um, and the red versus the clear greenhouse, which is our PV installed greenhouse, you can see that we're still getting um, generally better performance under the clear, under the red greenhouse than the clear greenhouse. Okay. But not always. You can see in the market, while we're getting about the same performance, um, and it'll just depend specifically on what crop you're looking at. Um, now, to do this accurately, we, we're trying to start working with farmers. We can install this in, 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 in farmer's sites, starting greenhouses, and removing the crop covered. So we need a, a large trial area on the impact on plants, because we, they, they leave us in the power production. We can give them a panel, and they can give us the power reasons. But they need to understand what's going to happen to their plants long term. We have a 6,000 square foot demo site now um, in Watsonville, California, at uh, KD, uh, uh, Kiyama Brothers Nurseries, where we're setting up now very big uh, plant trials that farmers can come in, put their plants underneath the red light versus the, the, the clear light, and see for themselves what happens up to their plants under our trial conditions. 
Now, uh, that one of the things that killed luminescent solar concentrators, or collectors, however you want to say it, early on, was the reliability issue. And that issue has largely been solved uh, now. Um, we've done a lot of tests on this particular LR305 material. If you put in UV stabilizers, this is an accelerated uh, uh, year's equivalent UV. Uh, the one-year light soaked is, is, is just what's sitting in our light soaking box. And what you can see, if you look at just the photoluminescence of this material, is very, it's, it's, it appears to be stable under accelerated conditions. And that the bill that goes up, the more UV stabilizers you stick in, the more, the more UV light um, that you can out of the system. Um, and in fact, we went into some of these, some of these growers actually had this LR305 material installed in their roofs 20 years ago when this material was first, when they were first claiming that it would help plant growth. And we can take the material off these farmers' roofs and measure it, and in fact, it's very photoluminescent, almost equivalent to a brand new uh, of cheese. Um, we've since, from this study, we've since had, had, had one of our panels light soaking in NREL for four months in at two suns in one of their United Chambers, and we, we have results from there. Um, showing that these, this data seems to be consistent. For that case, it's only 10 years. We only have data up to 10 years. Um, we're hoping to get data out to 20 years of equivalent Okay, so I'm almost done here. I just want to cover one more topic and then uh, I'll open up your questions. Uh, one of the things we're talking quite a bit about is uh, algae experiments. This is what we do with, with NASA AIDS. Um, there's interest in, in greenhouses for algae because of minimizing the water consumption. Um, and optimizing the growth condition, and particularly algae is really sensitive to contamination in open ponds. It's one of the things that kills it as it, and makes it a very expensive biofuel. So um, we're working with uh, hoping that, you know, you can't put greenhouses over algae ponds because it's too expensive. It just makes the algae too expensive. However, if a greenhouse can pay for itself by producing you produce, then all of a sudden you've got a potentially uh, viable product. So the nice thing about algae is it really likes red light. It really likes 600 to 650. So it looked like a potentially promising area to, um, to look at. And, and the reason why NASA's interested and the reason why we're potentially interested in is you can look at the um, oil appetite for the United States. If you look at corn, you'll see that if you try to solve it with corn, it takes up you know, a lot of Canada and uh, almost most of the United States. Um, algae grows very, very quickly. One of its benefits, we can do an experiment. You know, our experiments on plants, see what the wavelength does, takes four to six months, we can do an experiment on algae in about two days to see what the wavelength of light does. So that's very nice. Um, and depending on what number you pick, you can very much, you can basically demonstrate that in, in a fairly small area, um, depending on your lipid content and, and various other things, you can, uh, if you can figure out how to do it cost effectively, algae is a, a potential uh, good biofuel. Okay. Um, so I'm going to conclude. All right, actually, I have two, two, one, two more slides. I got one more slide. So I talked about, started about this about sustainable. So why is this? What does this have to do with sustainable agriculture? It obviously has, has to do with agriculture. So why sustainable? Well, um, I would argue that if you're simultaneously producing crops and electricity using the same piece of land, that aids in the sustainability of our agricultural system. Um, in some areas, because we're lowering the cost over the PV, I think there's a five-year return on investment. And not in all of the United States, that's certainly not the case, but the places like California, Hawaii, and some of the more expensive electricity places like Italy, Spain, Japan, and strikingly enough, Brazil, even though they have a lot of hydroelectric there, they're growing so fast, um, they just actually just introduced a feed-in tariff. Those types of areas, um, you can, we can get actually a pretty uh, fast return on investment. You can reduce water consumption because crop covers reduce the water evaporation rates. Um, and you can also use the covers themselves as water collectors uh, to, to use the water uh, uh, wisely. You um, can consume more CO2 if you have a closed greenhouse because a lot of people now are just feeding the CO2 in, from power plants or natural gas generators directly in the greenhouse. Um, plants like about 1,000 parts per million of CO2. The Earth's atmosphere is about, uh, I guess we're at 380 or 400, I can't remember, parts per million. So in fact, uh, you want to have a slightly elevated CO2, so it's very efficient at converting CO2 over to uh, oxygen. Then you, re you can reduce use of pesticides because, believe it or not, these bugs get freaked out by the different colors. Um, and you know, you can see, for example, noticeable changes in white flies. Um, uh, there's also an issue about potential bees pollinizing, that the red flower might not be bad for that because if you cut out the UV, the bees might not really find the flowers. But in fact, the bees are pretty smart and learning. Um, and you wouldn't put red all over it, you'd actually just put the red on there. There's interesting applications for confusing insects. 
And then, of course, what we really want to do is increase crop yields per unit acre. We can use the red color that the little nest material puts out to increase our crop yield. Um, that would be useful if you get more, more production out of the new pizza more. So, I hope to convince you here is that solar farms and agriculture are, are promising um, alternatives to solar farms and deserts. Uh, and that providing a solution to, uh, to agriculture solar farms presents a new opportunity for you guys and for the federal tech community. Um, and uh, next thing I'm going to talk about, I'll open up discussion. The next thing I'll talk about, of course, is the ultimate sustainability challenge, which is PV in space. space. Thank you, amazing talk and very motivating. Uh, so you mentioned that the plants need both blue and red wavelengths, and the blue is used for biomass. So uh, I, I missed that part. Could we absorb the blue part by solar cell or whatever? Uh, what happens to the plant? Could we only let the plant have the red light? Right, so what would happen is you would, so the plants need a certain amount of biomass, a certain amount of, um, green leaf to support the, the, the flower production and the and sugar production. So if you cut out too much of the blue light, you're going to, um, the plants can not yield as much fruit is what happens. But you can cut out a lot more of the blue light than the red light. And the exact formula is very tricky. It depends dramatically on um, the crop. So, you know, nowadays, you know, it used to be for growing roses, for example, they would just, they would only want a certain amount of long stems, right? They just cut off the base of the roses, right? They don't do that anymore because doing that, they cut out the leaves, which help the biomass. They actually break the stems down. We, we traveled over, we visited probably about 30 greenhouse growers um, and we put together um, the plants, trying to get what they, you know, listen to what they wanted. Um, so it's, it's a bit, the question is very complicated. You can't cut out all the bloom. You can't. You can cut out all but you gotta let through all the red. If you cut out the red, it's, it's no Thank you. <laughs> so, so do you envision this just for the sort of the existing greenhouse agriculture work? Could you apply this to crops to end the yielding of the total take to non to three non greenhouse crops? Right. So we would like to do crop covers. So there's a lot of a lot of agriculture is actually under shade. Um, not just greenhouses, but actually, you know, under shade covers. We'd like to put it in shade covers. The, the issue there is um, right now our return on, on investment is pretty quick for greenhouses because we're reusing the glass, we're using the metal frame, just popping the frame back, putting our technology, laminating together, and sticking it back in. And the farmers install the panels themselves. They don't even want us to install them. You know, so the installation issue isn't there, right? They'll say, oh, well, give us the panels, we'll put them up on a roof. Because they install their glass panels, replace their plastic all the time. So, the greenhouse is, a, is an easier market to enter into, and we have to make, we couldn't do it for glass for crop covers, we have to figure out how to work with plastic, and then you've got thermal contraction issues, but we would like to go to crop covers, just to answer, it's long, long to answer the question, so but yeah, this is all, this is all glass right now. And then how, how, how much electricity in California, for example, did you generate just for greenhouses? Um, it would not be, it, it would not meet, uh, uh, California's energy need. I haven't actually done the done the full calculation. I think it would be. That's a good question. I should calculate that out. I mean, for most of the greenhouses we're talking about, we're just trying to worry about their payback time. So, for example, one of the greenhouse growers we talked to, you know, he has a million dollar a year electricity bill. You know, we can zero that. You know, so we're trying to zero that out. So we're just right now worried about zeroing out the greenhouse grower electricity bills, which is not going to. In the introduction, you mentioned that uh, the deserts might be uh, one sink of carbon dioxide. And I missed a little bit uh, the mechanism how this uh, works. Well, there's there's lots of people debate that, and I, I think the results are still preliminary, and it's highly controversial. But some people, one of the reports claimed it was oxides uh, sitting inside the soil, inside the sand, are actually can actually take up oxygen. And other people claim it's the microorganisms, like the algae and stuff sitting in the soil, doesn't take but, and, you know, I should say that the results are still, you know, there's some people that are claiming that this is the mixing carbon sink lake, right, the deserts. There's a lot of people in the community that don't believe that. Okay. So it's, it's controversial, but, yeah. Yes? So two questions about the back of the I assume that 
dye is apparently dye? It's apparently red. Yes. But BASF, is that it? It's BASF LR305. And the second thing is why? Why not put the solar cell on the edge of the concentrator rather than in the middle? Is there, is there a reason? Yes, there's, there's several reasons. Um, the main reason is if you put it on the edge, or it would be here, uh, start with it's a very difficult, it's a lot more difficult assembly process. Um, the other reason is you don't get them to write the direct light falling on the PV cell. It ends up the PV cell, direct light falling on the PV cell is 50% of our power. We don't want, if you put it on the edge, it's very easy to get a gain less than one. That is, you just take the PV and, and shine directly on sunlight and you get more than putting it on the LSC. That's one of the problems with LSCs. Um, so this way we're up, we have to get a gain greater than one. For, you know, for purely concentrated, and the reason why this works is, you know, LSCs were great. The idea that you're going to get a 1,000x were great when PV panels were $10 a watt, right? Now they're a dollar per watt. The economics of high concentration isn't there anymore. So, um, so now all of a sudden you can put it on the face. Any more questions? Yeah, I was curious how, how is the current being collected from the entire meat masters? How the current is being collected from the entire greenhouse? Do you need to have lines of bulk in the negative curve? Right, so we have, I don't know if you saw this, uh, the typical array here. This is actually not the most efficient design. We've got, this is a string of 48 cells that are 2 centimeters. This is exactly this dimension. We spent a lot of time on 1 centimeter versus 2 centimeters. 2 centimeters is, is, is not quite as, is, is, our, is our optimal structure right now. So um, they're hooked up. We have 48 cells hooked up in um, series. Okay. And we do different different layouts. The other layout I showed earlier on, the one that was this, this structure, the honeycomb is actually a more efficient layout. Um, so yeah. Now we use and we use sun power cells, which have dropped in factor by two since we started this project. Right now, they're, now we're getting to less than a buck a watt. We started out at like that. <laughs> Well, we don't have a startup yet. We're working with this company called Ampago Solar. Um, the issue is, uh, you know, we can contract manufacture it all out in Silicon Valley. It's just, you know, we just put these PV cells down, cut them up, and laminate all together. So what we use is this sheet, this luminescent sheet that we that we get, get purchased from a company, actually. Um, the problem is to get to manufacturing so we can get this five-year payback time, we have to have, um, you know, you have to be able to buy things in million-dollar bondage, you know, I have to buy the domestic sheet and put down a bill, a purchase order for $200,000. I don't have $200,000 to do it. But, you know, we're, we have plans for potentially how to move this into manufacturing. But we really need to make sure that the, the farmers are happy. So our, our biggest thing right now is uh, getting trials installed at farmer sites and getting enough money to be able to install them. Because right now, you see all those panels, you see all those cells? Those are hand-soldered by, my, by um, uh, students, and well, not students, actually, some employees in the company. And usually, we need an automatic soldering tool. And stuff. These things are doable, it's just, you know. Yeah? As, as it looks, there's a lot of uh, need in Spain for these things. Maybe you can produce them there. In space and where? And install it in Almeria on the top. I would love to do that. Um, because the yeah, yeah, idea you know, you get it cheap. <laughs> Maybe potentially. There's a lot of workforce. <laughs> there is a lot of workforce. And I would point out that it probably is not, it probably not a coincidence that this is a joint collaboration. Uh, we get funding from both the uh, UC Discovery program, which has now been killed, and Ambigo Solar. Ambigo Solar is Ambigo is headquarters is in uh, Seville, which is in uh, Spain, which is in that southern part of Spain. Sevilla. Okay. Okay, well, let's take a short break and then.